Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Edible Education. It's our third class meeting of the semester already. It's great to have everyone here. Alice has been working with the students already on this special project, which you're going to hear more about. It's very exciting. Um, there's a lot already happening in the garden this week. You know, just last week I showed you all those bare rose branches. Oh, by the way, my last name, Rosenzweig, it means rose branch. I don't know. Um, there's, a, there's a word for that. I'm trying to remember what it is. It's a, like an anonym or something. Michael Pollan has the same kind of thing where you're your name and your profession are related. But um, on the right uh, is the first, um, that's a rose bush, and that's the first flush of a leaf, leafing out, that's called. Uh, as the weeks progress, you'll see that turn into a bud and a flower. And on the left, those will be nectarines. So that's a small nectarine tree that's just that's called bud break so it's happening already it happens so fast I just can't keep up with it I also brought you this week more of those wonderful um, Valencia oranges and I I have to say I've learned something which is the the uglier the peel the sweeter the juice so don't be deterred by a um, cosmetically imperfect piece of fruit. For those of you that got to savor one of these last week, please leave time for your colleagues who didn't to help themselves this week. And I also brought, I brought fresh bay leaf, which is really amazing if you break the leaf. So if you're making any kind of a stock or a soup or um, these also dry really nicely. They're also um, antiseptic, they're uh, medicinal. So in indigenous cultures, the bay leaf is a magic healing property. People even make it into a tea. So please, I brought, there's a bunch of branches of them. Help yourself and, um, and enjoy. So as you'll recall, Wendell Berry got us immersed in the pleasures of eating in the first class and Alice came and really uh, effusively connected us to the senses and the, the values of beauty and seasonality and taste and deliciousness. Um, we also entered the realm of ethics, how our values play into our food choices and our conception of the world, our mindsets. And of course, according to Wendell, the third aspect of food that is ever present is politics. And we're going to be focusing on that tonight. Aesthetics, ethics, and politics. So as you got to meet the inimitable Alice Waters, thanks for coming back to class tonight, Alice. Um, I have watched over the years with great astonishment Alice's great creative talent of feeding people an idea. And many people would consider Alice a uh, visionary. Uh, you know in your um, assignment last week, you were to identify some of your core values and then reflect on how your core values are either aligned or misaligned with your actions. Um, I'm so excited to read your reflections and um, gain more insight to where you're at. This idea of the visionary, what, what is a visionary? Does anybody have a definition of that? Or what, what's a vision? Just, yeah. Mm. Mm. Looking into the future and seeing what needs to be done, uh, a lens into the future of what, what is needed. That's a, a beautiful definition. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. Forward oriented, forward thinking, uh, progressive uh, view of the future. Anyone else? Yeah. 
can imagine what the world I want to live in. So imagination is really essential for vision. How, how often do you all use your imagination during the day and in school? I'm just a little bit. How many people think they use their imagination a little bit at Berkeley? Just a little. How about a medium amount? Does anyone use their imagination a lot? That is very, that, I'm, I'm proud of you, but that's <laughs> disappointing. <laughs> so to be a visionary, you really have to exercise your imagination. You have to think about what's possible and not be constrained by the current reality. You have to let your imagination go free. Now, is a vision a fantasy? Is a vision science fiction? Is a vision magical realism? I don't think so. I'm using the term vision to be something that is actually grounded and connected to our current reality. So it, it contains a believability of what's possible. But visionaries are always um, ridiculed. <laughs> and doubted by people who are constrained by the, um, the current reality. So I want to um, share a tool with you tonight that's called the Creative Tension Model. And it's a tool that uh, change makers use. And change makers, when they are creating a vision, you'll remember like when Alice was sitting up here last week, she was able to describe a future where every student would have the benefit of eating fresh, local, seasonal food that was delivered, brought from a local farm, and prepared with care and love and provided enormous nourishment in every respect. That's a vision. And some people might think that is close to impossible, and other people might think, hmm, how might I get started on manifesting or cultivating that vision? So change makers are adept at creating, a, fostering a shared vision. And as I said earlier, Alice's approach to that is to feed people an idea through their senses and experience so that they get it because words are often not enough. And since we're working in the realm of food, there's a wonderful opportunity to engage all the senses. Change makers foster a shared vision, and then they are able to translate vision into action. And they're able to sequence the steps to go from one thing leading to another. They're also able to do this in a way that they do small, quick, rapid experiments to learn quickly. They maintain an amazingly energetic and optimistic view of possibility. They're resilient in the face of failure. They just keep going because they believe in the vision that they're trying to bring to reality. So let me share with you this idea of the creative tension model. This is something that was developed by um, a musician named Robert Fritz, and was later adopted by Peter Senge at MIT in their organizational learning laboratory. And you start with a vision, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little mime for you now, but you start with a vision, and the clearer you can paint that vision or describe or define that vision, the better. And the more you can bring other people into defining and designing and describing that, um, the stronger and more shared it will be. Um, next to the, the vision is the current reality. The current reality is where we are right now, where we are right now. And in describing a current reality, it's often good to use the practice of trying to be as objective as possible. Um, one of my important teachers used to call it telling the truth without blame or judgment. Can we just describe the current reality without blame or judgment? How does it exist right now? So if you were to um, describe your food life, 
right now, you could write down the current reality. The current reality is that I eat ramen four days a week. Um, I get over to Chipotle once, and if I'm really lucky, I get to eat with my friends on Sunday night. Um, if you're Alice, it looks a little bit different. You know, she's got her tortillas and beans in the morning, <laughs> and then I think I've seen her at Chez Panisse on some evenings. But so how do we describe our own current reality? And then how do we describe the vision of the future or the life we'd like to, um, to participate in? And between the vision and the current reality is natural tension. Now, change makers see that tension as creative, which means it's a tension to be um, explored and um, transformed into action, or what we call pathways. So if your vision, you know, I, I want to eat like um, uh, the king of England, and right now I eat like a student, you may have a tremendous amount of tension between the current reality and the vision. And it may be very difficult to sustain that tension, like to stay in a place of commitment. So what change makers are able to do with groups of people is manage this tension. So creating visions that are connected to the current reality, but not constrained by them. Does this make sense? This is a tool that's going to be important and helpful for you to use in your projects later on in the semester as you set the course for your own change-making journey. I'm going to ask you to use this model to describe the future and, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards, and the, the current reality. So last week, um, when Alice was describing her vision, of the way she would like everyone to be able to eat. Uh, Max very uh, respectfully and tactically asked the perennial question, uh, doesn't this effectively leave a lot of people out? Doesn't this um, commitment to local, organic, fresh, healthy, um, doesn't, isn't this inaccessible? Isn't this elite? Um, and we get this question every year, and Alice answers it in Alice's way. And um, so last week I said, well, who wants to figure that out? So immediately, 20 of you signed up, and we've got a project now. So we've got the vision, how do I eat like Alice Waters as a university student? And we've got the current reality. And just before class tonight, our 20 extra credit challenge change makers came up and started to diagram out how they're going to approach this hypothesis and see what they can learn about it throughout the semester. And then at the end of the semester, we challenge them to share their results with you. So this is going to be a side uh, project. If any of you want to help out or be a, a resource or a helper or participate in a survey, I'm just really excited about the possibilities of this very talented auditorium of people taking on this challenge. And, and Alice is already working with the team. Uh, and so I'll just move on from there. <laughs> so I like to think of people that can um, combine vision with pathways from the current reality as pragmatic visionaries. These are people that can see the future, dream of the future, and connect it to the actions that make it a reality. So they transform ideals into action. They create inclusive, creative, inspiring pathways. They have a long-term orientation. They're incredibly resourceful. Resourceful in entrepreneurship means getting resources under your control that you don't currently own or, or have power over. Or a lot of times it's inspiring people to do things that they didn't even know they wanted to do. Um, pragmatic visionaries, they're persistent. They're also patient. They also have a bias for action. They're always thinking about the urgent next thing that needs to be done to advance toward that vision. 
Tonight we have a very special guest. I'm so excited to introduce you to Marian Nessel in just a minute. She is probably the um, nation's leading expert on food politics. She's um, a highly respected scholar and author. And I'm just so happy that she came back to Berkeley. She got her PhD here when she was studying marine biology. And you'll remember we shared with you this kind of simplified diagram of the food system, a healthy food system. It's really more of a supply chain. We showed you where Alice has intervened in the system last week and how she's kind of cut out a lot of that whole right side of the um, diagram by working directly with farmers and even bringing the waste and compost into a closed system. Um, I thought I'd introduce another variation of a food systems map to you tonight. There's many versions. This one actually contains different systems. Uh, we'll put this in B courses so you can look at it more clearly, but this has economic systems, social systems, um, policy and political systems. And I think this is probably more reflective of the world that Marion is gonna talk about tonight. Also, the leverage points that I showed you on that simple supply chain aren't really um, relevant in food politics. Food politics is all encompassing, all the laws, all the lobbyists, all the energy that's influencing the how things get done in the food system are just pervasive. And I think um, tonight Marion will make that um, very visible to you. I also, in a, in a conversation with one of you during the week, um, was, you know, just shared this insight, which I really value and I appreciate, that privilege is its own leverage point. And something that those of us that have the privilege of being in a class like this, being at UC Berkeley, um, despite many of the obstacles that each of us might face in one way or another, privilege is its own leverage point and having the possibility of being able to help and make things better. How do we bring the special gifts and talents that we each have to, um, to the system? All right, uh, Marion is here. Marion just uh, published another book. I can't even count anymore. Um, her seminal text was Food Politics. There's a wonderful book too, if you don't get enough of Marion tonight, called Let's Ask Marion. It's a, it's a dialogue, but you're gonna get plenty of time to ask Marion tonight. But her latest book is called Slow Cooked, which is perfect, and it's a beautiful memoir. We'll talk more about it. But Marion's gonna show you how all of this fits together. I think going from the aesthetic and the ethical to the political and the data-driven will be a wonderful complement to Alice's presentation last week. Please welcome Marion Nessel. I'm gonna change so the slides this is, now. This is for the slides? Mm -hmm. I can't just hit the computer? You could, you could. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna change this. You're gonna find my slides. I'm gonna, I'm going to switch I over to your slides. I just want you to slides. know I had tech support today. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. I have a new computer and it didn't like jump drives. Um, that. That's it. And that, and you can just push that button. I if you think want. that'll work great. Let's, Why don't I do let's that? Let's let the screen. There we go. Food Politics 2023. Wait. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. I love being here. I was a student at Berkeley for 16 years, <laughs> some extraordinary period of time. I have a lot of degrees from Berkeley. I really like coming back, and I couldn't believe the trees are in bloom. I live in New York City. The trees are not in bloom in New York City. Trust me. Um, as Will said, uh, or I should say, I write books about food politics. I, I have a lot of them. The ones you see up here are 
the ones I've written since 2002, and there are a few edited ones thrown in there. Um, but my most recent book is a memoir, and Will wanted me to talk about that, so I will talk about it, but at the end of my um, more content-y presentation. I want to start with this cartoon that came out a couple of weeks ago in the Ithaca Journal. Um, and so here's Dilbert saying he can't wait to try out ChatGBT. Um, how many of you have tried out ChatGBT? Every, if you haven't, you need to. Um, so G Dilbert asks, how would you describe the diversity of humanity? And the answer is one word, food. Um, and then Dilbert says, somebody needs to teach you to lie. But I actually think this is true because you can explain everything through food. Uh, you can absolutely explain everything. Food connects to everything. It's why I like it so much. Um, and in this slide, I'm just showing uh, Republican and Democratic food, uh, where uh, we, we have a food divide in this country. We absolutely have a food divide, um, where food connects with personal issues like taste and who your peers are, what your religion and culture are. Um, but it also has a political identity, identity as well, uh, where how much money you have and how much education you have and how much power you have uh, have a great deal to do with your food choices and how you eat. Um, I want to talk about the reality of food in this country, and I can't do that without talking about COVID-19. Um, just two years ago, Everybody was really upset because there were 500,000 deaths from COVID-19. I looked at the figures this morning and it's now up to more than 1.1 million deaths. And COVID-19 is intimately connected with the food system. Food connects to everything. Um, and I want to say just a little bit about that. Uh, the death rates from COVID-19 are not random and they're not equal. Uh, the deaths among Native Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, Black Americans are much higher than among White and Asian Americans, and age is an issue as well. But we have real disparity in reaction to a disease like COVID, and those disparities come from uh, what the public health people call social and behavioral determinants of health, uh, more than individual choice. And what that idea is, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is that what race you are, how much money you have, your level of education, the kind of neighborhood you live in, what your family is like, what your social status is like, have an enormous impact on whether your body weight is within what are considered to be um, reasonable limits, whether you have obesity-related chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, uh, heart disease, certain kinds of cancers, and pulmonary dysfunction, and whether you have severe outcome from COVID-19. The point is that social and behavioral determinants affect obesity, COVID-19, and all of these diseases, and they're completely inextricably linked. You can't talk about one of them without talking about all the others, and you cannot understand what's going on in our health system without understanding social and behavioral determinants. And one of those determinants is what we eat, and it's an important one. And that, of course, is the one I wanna focus on. Um, I wanna talk about the politics of food, particularly as a social and behavioral determinant of health. And I want to talk about what I think are the most important issues in nutrition these days. <clears throat> and these are food systems, triple duty dietary advice, uh, and ultra processed foods. And then I want to end by saying something about advocacy uh, to pick up on, Vil on Will, what Will was talking about with vision. So let me start with food systems. The world divides into lumpers and splitters. <laughs> I'm a lumper. I like really simple diagrams. Um, so this is a very simple diagram of the food system, which says that 
if you want to understand anything about a food, you have to understand the way agriculture, food, nutrition, and health are linked together. Uh, food system describes the entirety of growing food, picking food, transporting it, selling it, buying it, cooking it, eating it, and wasting it. Um, and then all of those other things in those diagrams, you're a splitter. Yeah. <laughs> all, all of those other things in those diagrams uh, obviously are very important as well. Um, but, I, I, you know, we have an ideal of what a food system is and ought to be. I can summarize the reality of our food system in one slide, and it's this one, which is a simple diagram of corn utilization in the United States. We grow a lot of corn in the United States. If you've been to the Midwest, you've seen a lot of corn. Here's what happens to it in 2022 and 2023. 60% of it goes to feeding animals, 60%. Some of that is exported, but all of the stuff that's exported is animal feed. 30% of it goes to fueling automobiles, ethanol for cars. I can't even get my head around that. It just seems so absolutely incredible. And what that leaves is about 10% for corn on the cob um, or whatever we use in the in the corn for in our food supply. So that's what our, that's the reality of our food system. And this is a food system that is very much on the burden. The burden of this food system is very, very much on the farmers, fishermen, agricultural workers, restaurant workers, I would add to this, who do all the work in this system. And this is where COVID-19 comes in, because if COVID-19 did any good at all, it was to expose the role of the workers who, who keep the food system up on their backs. Um, because what we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic was an enormous number of deaths among people in meatpacking plants, particularly. And a, a reporter, um, so the government wasn't tracking these kinds of deaths, but a reporter was, and she produced these ongoing um, counts of the number of deaths among farm workers in general, but uh, meatpacking workers in particular. And the diagram with all the bubbles is the companies where that had the most, most deaths, Smithfield, um, Tyson Foods, and so forth. The, um, we saw the effects of this in the president's order to keep the meatpacking plants open uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, even though it was killing the workers that were in there because they were all lined up together and didn't have protective equipment and nobody was really paying much attention to them. And we now know from investigative reports by journalists that the meatpacking companies themselves were responsible for writing the president's executive order. They actually wrote it out for him and he signed it and, and promulgated it. Um, and the also, and there have also been investigative reports showing that the meat industry uh, collaborated to raise prices during the pandemic and to, to kind of use their market power to create shortages, raise prices, and grow their profit margins. They did very, very well during the pandemic. Um, the, sh the chef, Jose Andres, who is doing so much around the world to feed people during emergencies, um, was responsible for this tweet in 2020 that I think just describes the whole thing. People of America, he said, I wanna talk about two photos that explain everything that's going on in the food system during the pandemic. On the left are mounds, mountains of potatoes that were being destroyed because there was no um, source system and no supply chain that could get potatoes to people who needed potatoes because of a breakdown in everything that was going on in the food supply chains. And that was happening at the same time that cars were lined up for miles and many hours to get handouts of foods at food banks. Um, 
an enormous irony uh, during the pandemic. So that's my introduction to what I think are the three major global food system problems in 2023. And these are obviously, these are global problems, hunger and food insecurity, obesity and the chronic diseases for which it's a risk factor, the environmental effects of how we um, grow, prepare, grow, prepare, and consume food. And now you have to throw the COVID-19 pandemic into the middle of that. And all of these are very closely related to dysfunctional food systems. Um, so let me say a little bit about all of those. First of all, the underlying root cause in public health terms um, is a food system driven to maximize profits. Let me say that quite bluntly. Um, it, food companies, it's, I, I think it's just critically important to understand that food companies are not social service agencies. They are not public health agencies. They're businesses with stockholders to please. And their primary purpose is to please their stockholders, which means making money and reporting growth to Wall Street every 90 days so the stockholders make a profit. And once you understand that and accept it and understand that this is the reality, uh, or accept it as the reality, not accept it, but accept it as the reality, a lot of what the food industry does make sense um, because its purpose is to generate profits regardless of the effects of its products on health. It's not that food company executives are sitting around a table saying, how can we make Americans sick? They're not doing that. They're sitting around a corporate table saying, how can we sell our products in a situation in which there's way too much food available in the United States? How do we sell our product in that situation? So that brings me to the issue of triple duty policies. Uh, a triple duty policy for dietary intake and for food choice is a diet that will simultaneously, at one and the same time, prevent hunger, prevent chronic disease, and prevent climate change, um, and help to keep people healthy so they don't get COVID-19 or don't have a bad outcome for COVID-19. And using a food systems approach to trying to think about that kind of diet, um, two very large committees of, uh, that were commissioned by The Lancet came out with reports in 2019. And these reports were called the Eat Lancet Report. That was the first one. And the second one was the Global Syndemic Report. And I'll, uh, uh, syndemic is not my favorite word, but that's what they called it. But let me talk about the Eat Lancet Report first, because its charge was to figure out what kind of a diet people should be eating in order to meet goals for planetary health. So they called this, um, if, if we're going to be feeding a population of uh, 10 billion people in 2050 or whenever that's going to be, we're gonna to have to figure out how to have enough food to feed everybody, but also prevent hunger, prevent chronic disease, and prevent climate change, with climate change being the planetary boundaries. And what they came up with was the planetary health diet. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the details on this, but just to summarize it by saying that it, this diet is one that contains roughly half of the meat intake that is currently consumed in the, in the United States and other developed countries, and roughly twice as much in the way of plant foods. So a halving of meat intake and a doubling of plant foods. Um, now, if you think about that for a minute, uh, the reason for the halving of meat has to do with the effect of beef production on climate change. Beef um, is the, and animal foods in general, have a much greater impact on climate change than, do the, than does the, the production of vegetables. Um, and particularly cattle, because cattle burp methane. And methane is worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Um, so that's part of, that's part of the rationale. Um, and it's a big part of the rationale. And so by reducing meat consumption, 
um, these reports said you would perform triple duty action. You would have healthier diets that would prevent um, chronic diseases and obesity. You would have more land for efficient, sustainable agriculture, and you would lower greenhouse gases. Hence, triple duty. Um, guess what? The meat industry didn't like this report. And they didn't like it a lot. Um, there was a lot of screaming in the press. I collected a few press clippings on this. Uh, fundamental lack of agricultural understanding. Um, the pork industry called the Eat Lancet report radical and irresponsible. Any suggestion of eating less meat makes the meat industry very unhappy. But the report was criticized on a number of grounds, um, some of them very entertaining. Um, the report was accused of having a vegan ideology, a first world ideology. It was accused of being hypocritical because the people on the committee don't eat that way. And it was accused of being impossible to follow. And there are grains in, of truth in all of that. Um, I've identified here the people that I know on the committee personally. As far as I know, none of them is a, is a vegan. Um, I mean, they may be, but I don't think so. And I can't speak for the others. But I don't think the report had a particularly vegan ideology. Um, the um, first world ideology does have a grain of truth in it. Because um, as, as this article said, the planet, this kind of a diet isn't much use to people in countries where they're really, really, really poor. And where, if anything, they would be better off eating more meat rather than less. And you know, I think that's correct, except that these people obviously didn't read the report because the report covers that issue quite well um, and discusses it in some detail. And in fact, they're redoing the report and doing another version of it where they will discuss this issue much more completely. I didn't really understand what the fuss was about because the pictures of the planetary health diet look to me almost exactly like the picture of a meal uh, that the Department of Agriculture, the United States Department of Agriculture produced at the same time to illustrate what the My Plate Food Guide was supposed to look like. Um, and it looked just like that. I, so I didn't understand what the fuss was about. I did understand the fuss about this one article that came out afterwards, which argued that um, the cost of the planetary health diet would exceed the household income of very, very large numbers of people in developing countries. And you can see that here. They, they calculated there were almost 2 billion people in the world who would not be able to afford the planetary health diet. And boy, does that get us into politics, because the cost of food is a big political issue. Um, but I want to say something about the second report, which was largely ignored. It came out a week. There was an enormous fuss about the Eat Lancet report. The Global Syndemic report came out a week later, and it was almost completely ignored. I think part of the reason it was ignored was nobody knew what syndemic meant. It's an anthropology term. And it refers to um, combined epidemics, an epidemic of hunger and malnutrition, an epidemic of obesity and chronic disease, and an epidemic of climate change was what it was referring to. Again, looking at this from a food systems point of view, another very simple uh, diagram. And what I liked about the Global Syndemic Report was that it did a political analysis. It attributed the current kinds of food systems to what they called con consumptogenic, I can't even pronounce it, con consumptogenic economic systems, which I think was a polite word for capitalism. Um, and these were economic systems that, priorita that prioritize corporate economic power. Um, that promote privatization of what used to be public goods, that externalize both the health and the environmental cost of our food production system, and that neglect the risks of allowing corporations to have this much power. And uh, the report went on to uh, 
analyze the cause oh, of the maintenance and the promulgation of this consumptogenic system, and they attributed it to what they call policy inertia. And the policy, I mean, nothing happening with policy. And they had three causes for policy inertia. One was weak government, weak governance or governments that are captured by corporations so they don't fight them. Um, a very powerful food industry with a very clear focus on profit um, and very weak civic demand for doing anything about it. So that if you're going to do anything to try to change the food system, you've got to make governance strong, you've got to control the food industry, and you've got to generate more civic demand. And I think all three of those are worth working on. They called for a transformative social movement that would do those things. Uh, I've never seen anything like that in a medical journal before. I thought it was the most extraordinary report, one of the most re important reports I've ever read. In the Lancet, of all places, a British, a very stuffy British medical journal. Um, they had, as part of the design for what you should do in this situation, they particularly focused on what you should do about um, putting some curbs on the food industry. They suggested stopping subsidies and tax breaks for food corporations, requiring companies to pay the externalized costs, health and environmental, of the way they produce food, uh, stopping industries' opposition to public health measures. Uh, there's lots in the newspapers all the time about the way in which the food industry interferes with public health attempts to um, you know, soda taxes and things like that. Keep the food industry out of public policy. Um, I had lunch today with a former Secretary of Agriculture who was enormous, who's just put out a report um, that she felt really pulled punches because they had food industry people at the table and it was a consensus report. She would like to see a report that actually says what kinds of policies we should have, and they couldn't do that because the food industry was at the table. Control conflicts of interest um, between people who are on these kinds of things and their relationship with food companies. Require food companies to declare the kinds of political um, donations that they're making to everybody and hold companies accountable for all of this. This is a pretty large order, but once again, I have never seen anything like this in another report, uh, particularly from a commission as prestigious as this one. So something to think about. And by restricting commercial interests in this way, you will have triple duty action. You'll have reduced opposition for policies to control obesity-related chronic diseases. Um, you'll be able to reduce corruption and have and be able to do more to reduce poverty because you won't be fighting opposition to that and you'll have you'll reduce opposition to policies on greenhouse gases. So all of this is connected and all of these things are linked with each other. Um, and I want to say one more thing about the criticisms of the Lancet report of the um, Eat Lancet report, and that's this one. Eat Lancet says you can save the planet on its diet. I tried it for a week and it didn't work. Um, because this person said, if you're gonna follow the diet, you're going to have to not eat packaged foods in nearly every aisle of the supermarket. There's not a chance that would happen in America. Um, so that brings me to the whole question of ultra processed foods. And these, this is a new concept. Um, the idea of ultra-processed foods was developed only in 2009, and um, ultra-processed foods are, the reason we care about them is because they've been very strongly linked to chronic disease, to premature death, and to problems with COVID-19 as well. Um, so ultra-processed foods were invented in 2009 by a group of faculty at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And the idea was that you divide foods into four groups. Um, and 
the four groups are unprocessed or minimally processed foods that look just like real foods, uh, processed food substances for culinary use like oils and salt and sugar and that kind of thing, processed foods that are somewhat more than minimally processed but not very much, and then the fourth category, which is the one we care about, is ultra-processed foods and drink, and it's this kind of a polite word for what we used to call junk foods. But it's a specific category of junk foods. Um, and it's a specific category of junk foods that are industrially transformed, so they don't look anything like the foods that they came from. And in fact, they replace the foods they came from. They have no evident relationship to, uh, to how they were made. You can't make them in home kitchens. That's a pretty, you know, a sort of a simple way of looking at it because you can't get the ingredients or you don't have the machinery to make it. And they contain a lot of color, flavor, and texture additives. They usually also have a lot of salt, sugar, and fat, but, it's, but salt, sugar, and fat are culinary ingredients, and they do not, on their own, make foods ultra-processed. Um, a little complicated, but there it is. Here's an easy, remember I'm a lumper, here's a, here's a lumping explanation of, uh, of ultra-processed foods. Corn on the cob is minimally processed, canned corn is processed, and Doritos are ultra-processed. They bear no relationship to corn. You would never know they were corn if they didn't say so on the package. Um, they're industrially produced. So why do we care? We care because by this time there is an absolutely enormous amount of scientific evidence that links ultra-processed foods to poor health outcome. And it links it clearly to a higher risk for obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and overall mortality. And the amount of research that does this is really incredible at this point. Now, those of you who are f familiar with um, epidemiological studies and observational studies will say, but association does not prove causation, right? You're going to say that. Um, so keep that in mind. But let me just point out that um, studies of the caloric, uh, the, the percent of calories that are consumed from ultra-processed foods show that in the United States and Canada, it's almost 60% of the calories. This is not an ultra-processed food. Um, the, um, so we consume a lot of it, and 21st century capitalism loves ultra-processed foods because they're really easy for companies to make, ship, and store. You can buy the ingredients when they're cheap, and then put them on a shelf for a long time. They have an aura of mo modernity. They're Western. You can sell them really well in countries all over the world. They're not very expensive, relatively, because you can buy the ingredients when they're cheap. They are extraordinarily profitable for the companies who make them. And there is an increasing amount of evidence for an addictive quality. I have it in quotation marks because I'm not sure that these things meet really firm definitions of addiction, but they're certainly designed to be irresistible. And for those of you who are familiar with Michael Moss's work, he documents that really well. And the easiest way to explain how irresistible they are is to remember that old Lay's potato chip ad where you can't eat just one. They're designed, they're formulated, they're made so you can't eat just one. You have a bag of these things in front of you, you just mindlessly chew away on it. Ultra-processed foods, irresistible, um, irresistibly delicious. So um, I, I make the point about association because in this particular situation, we actually have a controlled clinical trial. And not just any controlled clinical trial, but a clinical trial that I think is the most important. I like hyperbole. I think this is the most important nutrition study done since the discovery of vitamins. Um, this study was done at the National Institutes of Health in 2019 by a researcher named Kevin Hall and his colleagues, and they have a confined metabolic ward. 
they have what is essentially a hospital set up with lots of locks on the doors and they get volunteers who are paid to come and stay in this place for a month and not leave eat whatever it is that they're given they can eat you know they can eat as much as they want from whatever they're given but they can only eat what's what they're given and they can't cheat because they're locked up um, and what this experiment did was to put these 20 volunteers for two weeks on an ultra-processed diet where everything they ate was ultra-processed and then for another two weeks in random order on a diet where the foods were processed or minimally processed but not ultra-processed. Ultra and the test here was to see whether the processing had any effect on whatever people were going to be eating. The investigator, I've heard him speak about this many times, his hypothesis was that he would not show a difference, that there would be no difference at all in the consumption of people who were eating the ultra-processed or the processed diet. And to his complete and total shock, there was not only a difference, there was an enormous difference of 500 calories a day. The people who were consuming the ultra-processed diet, that's the blue line, ate 500 calories a day more on average than, the people, than when they were eating the generally processed diet. And not surprisingly, they gained weight. Now, I can't even tell you what an enormous number 500 calories is in a study like this. Most people who do dietary comparisons, and these studies are very hard to do, but most of the people who do dietary comparisons are happy if they find a difference of 50 calories. Kevin Hall found a difference of 500. He doesn't know why they consume 500 more. You know, he asked them, could you tell the difference between the two diets? No. Um, did you know you were eating ultra-processed foods? No. Did you like one diet better than the other? No. The only thing that he could, do, he, the difference that he could find was that people ate a little bit faster on the ultra-processed diet. And he's now doing experiments to try to sort out various hypotheses for why this happened. Irresistibly delicious, so that you overeat and don't realize it very, very important study with an obvious implication, just an obvious implication. Cut down on ultra-processed foods. Don't eat them. Minimize them, or don't eat very much of them. The, um, now, guess what? The food industry didn't like Kevin Hall's study, and they don't like the concept of ultra-processed foods a lot. And this is a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago from the European Food and Drink Association in which they explain that the concept of ultra-processed doesn't mean anything, you can't define it, you don't understand it, it's confusing, it's illogical, it's unscientific, it threatens traditional diets, and it undermines public health. There's a big pushback on the concept of ultra-processed. I've been talking a lot about big pushbacks. If, you're, if this is the way that you view the nutrition world, you're gonna get a lot of pushback. And I think that's unfortunate because from my standpoint, remember I'm a lumper, diets are really simple. And they are so simple that the journalist Michael Pollan can do it in his famous seven words. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And really, that's all there is to it if you understand that what he means by food is food that is not ultra-processed. I mean, that's really the only explanation that you need. You eat this way, food, not too much, mostly plants, not exclusively plants necessarily, mostly plants. Um, you're going to do fine, and you don't need to worry about anything else. It's really, really that simple. I'm a lumper. Uh, so let me say something about, okay, how do we advocate for this? Um, I think it's really important to get involved in advocacy, and there are lots and lots of ways of doing it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit, because Will asked me to, um, about why I wrote the memoir and what that's about. Because I think of the kind of work that I've done in my career as being flat-out advocacy 
but done in an extremely well-referenced way. I write very long, detailed um, books, books about um, food politics that have lots and lots and lots of references. I get attacked all the time on my opinions. I never get attacked about the science. Um, because I'm really careful about that. So why a memoir? Well, the pandemic. Um, I was stuck upstate in Ithaca, New York, where it's very cold in the winter, and um, I couldn't get into libraries. I usually you know, need libraries for the kind of work that I do. Um, I couldn't get into my office. I couldn't get into anything. I couldn't even get into my papers that are collected at the NYU library. Uh, so I thought, okay, this is the time. Um, to really use this time to reflect on the kinds of questions that I get asked all the time about how did you do what you do? How did you get interested in food? How did you get interested in nutrition? How did you get interested in taking on the food industry? How do you feel about all that? Those kinds of questions. And then questions about, um, I want to do what you do. How do I do that? And so I thought, okay. This is a chance to sit down and think through it. And the result of it is the book you see here, um, slow cooked because it took me a really, really long time to figure it all out. Um, and I think that the book illustrates a number of, of, you know, you're supposed to always talk about themes. The book talks about the effect of my, particularly my version of a dysfunctional childhood on what I did later on. There was a lot about what it was like to be a woman in science. Um, overcoming barriers and persistence, all of those things that Will was just talking about, and values. And I, I have to say, I've, I, I grew up with a set of values, and I've kept them throughout life. Um, so I'll just go, it never occurred, I have to tell you, it never occurred to me that I would be either considered as a powerful foodie taking on the food giants or as the country's most hysterical anti-food industry fanatics. Um, and I've been called both of those things. It, it never occurred to me. I started out um, loving food. I got interested in food because I just really like to eat. And um, I ended up, uh, you know, for peculiar reasons, doing a doctorate in molecular biology here in Berkeley. I finished it in 1968. Um, and I've always been kind of interested in the connection between science and history and sociology and anthropology and all of those other things, social values and health and all of that. Um, and I had the opportunity in my first teaching job um, at Brandeis University, where I was in the biology department teaching cell and molecular biology, and they handed me a nutrition class to teach. Um, and these were some of the resources that I used in that first class. And we're talking 1975 here. Uh, Diet for a Small Planet had just come out. It's just celebrated its 50th anniversary edition. Um, Center for Science in the Public Interest had published a book called Food for People, Not for Profit that could have been written yesterday because it's a book about food issues. Um, and then, I'm, you know, I was at a university, the New York Review of Books had a series of articles from a Brandeis historian uh, on wealth and power and the politics of food. And I was talking about these kinds of things in 1975. Um, I guess you could say I'm stuck in the same place. <laughs> um, from 1976 to 86, I was, at UC, I was at UCSF as an associate dean in the School of Medicine. I ran a nutrition education program there, and I just thought it would be fun for you to see. I did a series of television programs on, KQ, on KQED at that time, and I thought it would be fun to see what I looked like then. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I also wrote a book in 1985 on nutri called Nutrition and Clinical Practice. And a couple of years ago, I went online to, I went on Amazon to see if I could get a copy of it. And I was absolutely astonished to see that they were selling one for $930. If you see one for $930, don't buy it. <laughs> It's really out of date. <laughs> I have no idea what that was about. 
Um, from 1986 to 1988, I was in Washington, D.C. Um, I had a really fancy title. I was the senior nutrition policy advisor in the Department of Health and Human Services. But what that meant was that I was the managing editor of the 1988 Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health, um, which was a big fat book that was the one and only Sur Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. And I explain all this in the memoir, how I got around to do that. And since 1988, I've been at NYU. Uh, I went to NYU as a full professor with tenure, one of the nicest things that ever happened to me in my entire life. And uh, NYU is a private uni university in the public service. They love what I do. How's that for a concept? Um, I mean, it's really pretty amazing. It's been a great fit. And I give lectures, I teach, I do media interviews. I write media op-eds. I blog at foodpolitics.com. I tweet at Marion Nessel. Um, and I've been doing that since 1988. I retired in 2017. Um, and this is what retirement looks like. Um, the one question I get asked all the time is, OK, how did it happen? How did you go from molecular biology to, uh, or even nutrition, to taking on the food industry? And I can define the exact moment when that happened. It was in 1991, and I was at a meeting at the National Cancer Institute in Washington, DC. The meeting was on behavioral causes of cancer. And by behavioral causes, they meant cigarette smoking and diet. And most of the people there were physicians and scientists who were anti-smoking activists internationally known. Um, and I have to say, I knew that cigarettes were bad. I'm not a smoker. I never was. I knew that cigarette smoking wasn't good for you. I also knew that cigarette companies advertised. Um, and what happened at this meeting was that these people, one after another after another, showed slide after slide after slide, this is pre-PowerPoint, slide after slide after slide, of pictures of cigarette advertising all over the world. Um, as people traveled, they were collecting photographs of cigarette advertising everywhere they went. And there was one particular presentation from John Pierce, who's a researcher at the University of California, San Diego, even yet, I think. Um, and he gave a presentation on cigarette marketing to children. And once again, I knew that cigarette companies marketed to children in some kind of theoretical way, but I had never paid any attention to it. And as I saw slide after slide after slide after slide of Joe Camel, clearly aimed at teenage boys, clearly, um, and the other kinds of advertising that cigarette companies were doing then and are still doing, I walked out of there thinking, I never noticed that before. And we should be doing the same thing for Coca-Cola. And there it was. And I, went, I left that meeting. And every place I went, I started taking pictures of soda company and McDonald's and other kinds of advertising everywhere I could. And I started paying attention. It was, it was the cigarette advertising was so much a part of the normal landscape. It was just everywhere. It was ubiquitous. I just had never paid attention to it. Soda industry advertising is ubiquitous. Pay attention to it. So that's what started it. That was it. I started writing articles about marketing. I started writing articles about food industry attempts to sell their products <clears throat> and the ways in which they sold their products. Yeah, if you could do that, well, that would be great. I'm about to choke. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, and so I started writing these articles about it. Oh, thank you very much. And then when, um, when I finally figured out that NYU really liked books, <coughs> I thought I will just take the articles and put them together into a book. And that's how food politics came about. So um, I'm still doing all that. I think of myself as an academic activist. 
I'm quite proud of that, happy to do it. Um, I'm, and I, the way that I do it, the, the way that I do it is through my books and through the articles that I write. These are articles in the American Journal of Public Health and in JAMA Internal Medicine. Those are the publications that I write for. Sometimes I write in popular places. And I certainly write on the blog. Pretty much every day. Um, so my point here is that this is the way I do it. You don't have to do it this way. You have to find your own way of doing it. And here I've made some suggestions. I get asked all the time, how do I get started? Well, you could start by joining organizations. I don't recommend starting your own organization. <laughs> I know everybody wants to do that. But if you do that, you're going to be competing from, with, for the same funding sources as everybody else's organizations. So it's much better to join one that's already functioning and doing something that you want to do. Um, you want to find an organization, all you have to do is say Food Advocacy Berkeley and watch what pops up. It'll be very impressive. Do the research. Learn how to do research. Learn how to use library and internet resources to get the kinds of facts and figures that you need to make the kind of case that you want to make. Learn how to speak publicly. Um, stand up and say what you think in class, in your organizations, in whatever. Um, you can have a lot of influence that way. I'm a great believer in writing letters to editors and op-eds. I think they're really useful. Um, Use social media. That's the way everybody communicates now. Um, I'm you know, kind of the wrong generation to be doing it, but I do tweet. <laughs> um, it's, and I do Instagram a little bit. But the, uh, you know how to use that stuff. Use it. Uh, it can be very, very influential. Learn how to lobby. All lobbying is is talking to your local congressional or local representatives about whatever legislation they're working on. Lobbying is always about legislation. Um, and see if you can get them to do what you want them to do. Learn how to organize. Uh, because if you really want to make change, you're, have, you're going to have to bring lots of other people on board with you. Um, and the bigger, the better. The bigger the group, the better, and the more powerful it is. You know, people in Congress say they're not really interested in individuals coming to see them unless the individuals are really rich. Um, but if a group of 10 people in their constituency come in, that'll make a really big impression. And it, oh, and by the way, it doesn't take much to buy a congressional representative. It can be done quite cheaply. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, when people say, what can I do? Run for office. You want power? You need, to have, you need to have power. And that's one way to get it. Figure out how to run for office and then do the most you good you possibly can in that. So that's the kind of thing that I'm, advocating, that I'm advocating for these days. I think it's really important to vote with your fork for the kind of diet that you want. Every time you make a food choice, you are voting for the kind of food system that you want. And I do think that that's very important. And the more people who are voting with their fork the way you want to, the quicker the food system will change. But I also think it's extremely important to get involved in politics. You can't avoid the politics because it's there whether you like it or not. You might as well learn how to use it. And I call that voting with your vote. Um, and I'll end here just to show that I haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marion. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Um, Marion, if you'd like to buy one of Marion's books, oh, 10-minute break, 10-minute break. <laughs> Francesca can facilitate you buying a book if you want. Marion could even I'll be persuaded it. to sign it. <laughs> if you want to put a question on the wall for Marion or bring us up a question, mm. we'll have a conversation from 7.30 to 7.50, OK? Now that you've got the, had the opportunity to meet Marion, 
you, um, you get a sense of uh, her spirit, her energy, the way she views the world, the way she speaks, and her blog is just the way she thinks and speaks. So it's, it's almost like waking up with her and having a conversation and saying, what did you, what did, you know, what did you see yesterday, Mary, and that, you know, fascinated you or surprised you or? I think I wrote about M&Ms today. M&Ms, it was, a, t tell us about that. That was amazing. You, you yeah, said, yeah. So uh, M&Ms has withdrawn those M&M characters with the feet. The spokes. The spokes. Spokes people. The, the spokes, spokes M&Ms. Yeah. Um, because Tucker Carlson, um, said that the shoes made them sexless. I just thought it was wild. I try to post something funny on Thursdays. Oh, it's Thursday Wednesday. funny no, Wednesday. day? Wednesday. 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 Wednesday, Wednesday is Thursday funny is day. funny. Monday is conflicts of interest. Friday is something to read. And then what happens in the middle depends on. But I, if there's something that I think is really funny, I always like to post it. So when's, if you're in a, if you're Thursday, a little down. Usually it's Thursday. I, I Thursday. think I'm doing plant foods tomorrow. I set them up on the weekend. I was um, wondering how you do that because it's I just, it it's weekend. so, you do it on the weekend. So you work the weekends. Yeah, not very much. Not very much. <laughs> a little. Um, what about this ultra processed food? Is, is that label going to be applied to foods made in a big vat in fermented like biotechnology is that like plant-based or yeah. cell-based yeah cell-based cultivated meat it is it going to be called ultra processed well you certainly can't do it in your home kitchen can you that's my definition um the definition is has a little squishiness to it and the um they're going to be one of these three lancet report commissions or in are working right now and there'll be there are three of them on ultra processed foods so i hope that'll pin down some of that stuff uh, but certainly the plant-based foods are because you couldn't possibly make them in your you home couldn't kitchen. make heme in your kitchen you can't make whatever that heme look-alike thing is and you can't isolate pea protein very easily and the um yeah and so all of that it seems like one, one of your secrets, too, you didn't really talk about it, but it strikes me that you really maintain your sense of humor thinking about Wednesdays. Don't you think this stuff is funny? I do. <laughs> I mean, because we live in this world now of like <laughs> anger-tainment, uh, where uh, people are intentionally getting people riled up, but you seem to really keep your, your wits about. I mean, some of these things are infuriating that I you don't write know. about. I mean, being called an a hysterical anti-food activist. So, I mean, I love food. He just got it all wrong. But I you, thought it was funny. But you, you have <laughs> some, I mean, maybe, is, is there some advice that if you're gonna get into writing that you need to develop a little bit of a thick skin in this era oh, yeah. that we I live in? I have a thick skin. You know, it's, I, I, I don't take a lot of this personally. It's, it's politics. If you're going to write a book with a title, with politics in the title, you have to expect polit you know, political pushback. And, you know, again, the, you know, the story that I told in Food Politics that I tell again in the memoir, um, when Food Politics came out, um, the, I was sent a letter by a lawyer for the Sugar Association saying that they had heard me on a radio program talking about food politics and that I had defamed sugar. What? How could sugar get its feelings hurt? How could you do sugar defamation? I mean, it was hysterically funny. And so I read this letter and it went on and on and on about how I had said that, that and that I of all people should have known better I said that soft drinks contain sugar and not, nothing else. You, of all people, should know that soft drinks contain high fructose corn syrup. I thought that was hysterically funny. <laughs> high fructose corn syrup is sugar. Do you think coming to, um, coming to this work at the stage of life that you did with the tenured faculty position at NYU 
gave you a certain amount of, you know, just personal confidence and, and oh, yeah. comfort to be able to speak your mind. Oh, I mean, yeah. That, Tenure was life changing mm, for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, really, well, I mean, and I should say, I went to NYU to chair a home economics department. The, uh, I'm laughing because I, I couldn't believe it still existed at the time. Um, and it's now nutrition and food studies. But I didn't care. I mean, it was just, I was a tenured full professor. That was a platform that was really solid at a university that really liked the kind of thing I was doing. I was very lucky, very, very lucky. Did you have some early champions kind of on your side? Who, no, no, never, <laughs> <laughs> never, no. You know, I mean, no, that was, I mean, I tell the story in the memoir, every bit of it was a fluke. You know, the, 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 depart, the home economics department um, was very old and, musty and I, I you know I tell the story in the book about how when in my first week on the job all these people came up and said to me you know we're so glad you're here it's just wonderful that you're here they really need you oh, we hate to mention this when you've only just gotten here and I thought what are they going to tell me your kitchen's dirty It was. It was. Well, we're, I guess one silver lining of the pandemic is that we have your memoir now. Because <laughs> it is a gift. It's really a gift. And I think, you know, it does, it does speak to um, persistence. It speaks to one thing leading to another. Um, and it speaks to finding something that you're so curious and passionate about that you do it on the weekends without seeming effort. So thank you. No, oh, really thank, appreciate thank that. you for that. Yeah, I mean, I never planned any of it. You know, it just, you know, a lot of it was driven by the fact that I had children quite young um, and I was responsible for them. So that kept me from quitting. <laughs> he, uh, you know, I had to keep going that for keeps them. You going. The, um, but I never planned any of it. And, you know, and you, you need to understand, I grew up in an era when women were expected to get married as early as possible and have as many children as possible and not work, absolutely not work. If you did work, you supported your husband. You know, when I went back to my 25th high school reunion, there was one other woman in my class who had a doctorate and, and I, I was in a class of about 450. Um, and all of the other women who were my friends in high school um, if they worked at all, they worked in their husband's business. So, um, so I was kind of unusual in that way. Uh, and, you know, I explain what that's about, too. Read the memoir. <laughs> it explains the whole thing. I like uh, this one. How do I convince my boss at, and work office to stop supplying us junk food constantly? Oh. Well, here's where community organizing comes in. I'm sorry, you gotta get your friends and colleagues to agree with you. Good luck with that. Um, I mean, I'll, let me tell you about a failure. NYU is a Coca-Cola campus, and I could do nothing about that. Um, I went, you know, I met many times with the vice presidents and talked about how terrible that was and how bad it was and how bad, you know, I do the whole thing. I wrote a book called Soda Politics on how to do this. And they said, if there's a strong student support for getting the sodas off campus, we'll do it. There was no student support, none. And, you know, and, and unless there were students who were organizing that kind of thing or were interested in health, I just couldn't do it on my own. Couldn't do it. Top down, couldn't do it. So I consider it a failure. Well, this, this one kind of win them all. relates that. What moments made you feel stuck? How did you get out of a funk? Well, I teach students. You're here. How could I possibly not be optimistic when there are so many young people who are interested in these issues? 
I mean, that's a big change. When we started our food studies programs at NYU in 1996, more than 25 years ago now, 26 years ago, you know, there, nobody was interested in food, except the people who were in our program and a few other places, but really, now there are food studies programs in practically every university. Every university has some kind of food program where they're talking about these kinds of issues, health and sustainability, you know, fresh, locally, seasonally grown, food and culture, the whole works, everywhere now. That's a huge change. I mean, part of it is taking a somewhat longer term view you know, I, I mean, one of the problems of being young is your viewpoint is very short because you haven't been around very long. But I can go through an enormous list of really big changes around food that have occurred in my lifetime. Organic foods, um, the number of places that are doing regenerative farming, um, the, you can go to any grocery store in the United States, and if you know how to do it, you can pick out a pretty healthy diet. It may not be perfect, but it's pretty healthy. You can do that. Um, and that's a big change. And the number, my favorite one, of course, is the number of students who are in food studies. <laughs> uh, I really like that one. One thing I hear in your answers and also in Alice's comments last week is just the importance of organizing, of acting together as a we. You know, in, in entrepreneurship courses, we call this, you know, enrolling people, whether we're enrolling them in a new solution or mm -hmm. new product. Um, we're gonna have Saru Jayaraman here in a couple of weeks. She's an expert organizer. Mm -hmm. Um, using, again, evidence and data mm -hmm. to drive um, rational adoption of new policies. And um, what, what have you learned in your life about organizing or enrolling? I want to go back to that slide, if that's okay. Sure. Oh. I have to switch oh, you, over. Oh, you took I can off. do it. Well, I was, um, I was because, trying to be efficient, but uh, I can do it. On the slide in which I listed the uh, you know, various ways in which you can get involved, I have a picture of what I think is the best book on organizing that I've ever seen. It's a manual of how you go about doing organizing for social change of one kind or another. And it's, yeah, there's, there it is. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, get that out of the library. Um, the, uh, it's very detailed. And Saru uh, Jayarman did a book um, called Bite Back, which I wrote the foreword to. But the afterword to it is, a, is a, about a five-page summary of what's in that mm. book. So if, you know, if she has a book here, you get a chance to see that. Um, but it just sort of lays out the steps. There are ways of doing advocacy that are demonstrably more effective than other ways. And to the extent that you do advocacy by the book, you have a much better chance of succeeding. You have to define a very, very precise goal. Not so easy, not so easy. Uh, you have to figure out who is the person who can achieve that goal for you. You know, who are the, you know, who is going to be able to make something happen? And then you design a campaign aimed at getting that person, convincing that person to do whatever or that body to do whatever you need it requires a lot of community organizing. Um, for those of you who are in public health, it's program planning and evaluation, except it's real program planning and evaluation. Program planning and evaluation always says that you go into a community and you work with the community to find out what the community needs and then you help the community get what they need. But that's not usually the work, the way this kind of thing actually works in practice. Usually people just go in and they decide and then they wonder why it didn't work. If you want advocacy to work, you do it by the book. You mentioned this um, 
advice of don't go start a new organization because we already have so many and they're fragmented and they're not coordinated. And they're fighting for the same resources. Right, and so do you have any advice for, I mean, I remember when Sam Cass was here a few years ago and he had had the opportunity to work at the White House level mm -hmm. and he was so frustrated about the, you know, inability to form like one massive mm -hmm. good food movement. Yeah, well this um, has been Michael Pollan's point for years that there is no food movement because it's not there are no coalitions. Coalition building is very difficult and the more organizations you have the harder it is because each organization has a leader and they don't want to give it up. Um, so the question you know the question is how can you get lots of organizations focused on the same issue um, and the anti-hunger people have done it best but even with masses of anti-hunger organizations forming coalitions, um, they still haven't been able to succeed in getting Congress to do what they want. And I'm starting to see coalition building of agricultural organizations. Uh, and those are really important because farmers are in big, small farmers are in big trouble. And if they united, maybe they would be able to get somewhere. And I'm seeing signs of that in the Midwest. Uh, that's pretty exciting, actually. But I think coalitions are what you have to have. And masses of people who are trying to uh, change the food system into something that's healthier. Do you have any good exemplars of, of organizations or, or organizational leaders who are forming coalitions? Saru Jai Arman, Saru. to pick a random example. Uh, I mean, what she's done on publicizing the shocking, the just shocking thing that nobody knew about, which is people who are on tipped wages, t tipped employees make $2.13 an hour in many, many states in the Union, many states. Well, okay. it'll be exciting to have her here in a couple weeks. The other thing about her work that I find so fascinating from a systems change perspective is that she focuses on research and data, mm -hmm. then she works with industry. She actually embraces industry to adopt progressive practices. Like she had the, um, I'm trying to remember, the higher road mm -hmm. restaurant order then, you know, meanwhile, she's being attacked right and left by the National Restaurant Association. Oh, yeah, they're, they're a tough, that's the other NRA. The other NRA. But then she's also working with legislation and policy to change the actual minimum wage in the state. Mm -hmm. And then her newest innovation is to create a new vehicle for restaurant workers to get their um, culinary certifications in a way that doesn't funnel money back to the NRA. So it's a real, you know, working at multiple leverage points in a very coordinated way. I, I find that that's a real innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's been doing it for a long time. She does it really well. Um. Well, you know what? This has um, been really a fantastic evening. I'm going to let uh, Viana come up and do the uh, assignment and the attendance. We'll sit here for a minute. Then uh, if you have a couple more questions for Marianne that you want to ask her or you didn't get your book signed, you can do that and we will call it an evening. And um, next week we'll welcome Mr. Haiku himself. Michael Pollan will be here uh, in conversation with, with you. And um, you'll get to uh, re, well, you can, you can perform the food rules for him. That's your homework. <laughs> And the other assignment is called Information or Influence. So this is a different than your weekly written assignment. It is a B courses quiz where you'll test your knowledge of common food labels and if you actually understand what these food labels mean and what they entail for those products. So this is due, the B courses quiz will open at 8 p.m. tonight and then it will all be due 
um, next Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. So a quick reminder for students who enrolled late, you need to submit your homework from the first two weeks by the end of the day this Friday, February 3rd, to not receive any late penalties. Okay? Can we have a big thank you for Marion coming all the way from New York? And now your favorite thing, attendance. <laughs> oh, so really quickly before attendance, so anybody who was enrolled in the MBA course, so this isn't exclusive to MBA students, just any grad students enrolled to the, in the MBA course, you'll have a final project that focuses on analyzing a food-centered organization or initiative using a systems thinking approach. Um, so this week we would like you to form into groups of three or four students to work on this final project throughout the semester, so start thinking about your groups, and then submit your groups to the Google form that we will email out to you. Um, so next week, I know we sent out an announcement today, but it's actually gonna be next week. Please plan to stay for about 10 to 15 minutes after class for more details on this final project. And now it will be attendance. Okay. A fun fact from last what, week's what attendance, I asked a question like, what Based do you want to cook now? And the most common answers were beans, um, citrus, and nettles. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> oh, it's a new world. <laughs> Everybody has a phone. Really? You get the last orange tonight, too. Oh, Mary, thank you. From yeah. my garden. So, let's see if I can do it. Do you need? Yes, yeah, you can. Do you need a certain program? Yeah. No. It's just. Yeah. Yeah, you need a Berkeley. E well, you'll oh, see, yeah. see if you need it. No, I get an oh, N NYU. I get an out. NYU. They used it at NYU. I get an NYU yeah. thing, <laughs> which I don't feel like doing now. Uh, mm. well, that's funny. That is really funny. Uh, Everybody good on the... There's Michael. He'll be here next week. Thanks again. Have a nice evening. Take care. Mm -hmm.